We're only a few weeks away from the U.S. presidential election, and the outcome could have a major impact on both the economy and markets. Joining us now to discuss is Thomas Feltmate, senior economist with TD. And Thomas, it's been a very tight race between Harris and Trump. Uh, what are the possible scenarios that you see playing out with the election? Yeah, no, uh, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. So you're absolutely right. When we look at national polls right now, uh, Harris has a very slight lead, I would say, but um, certainly nothing definitive that we can call uh, just yet. And I think that's particularly true when we look across kind of those seven key battleground states where voters are still pretty split in terms of both Trump and Harris. So, um, you know, that being said, I think we can kind of look and draw some inference in terms of what are the most probable outcomes of the election. And I think we, we kind of see two equally probable outcomes. Uh, the first is basically a status quo in terms of the makeup of government where Harris would win the White House, but yet Congress remains divided. Uh, and then the other scenario would be a Republican sweep. And, you know, the main reason we think this is if you look at the number of how, uh, seats that are up for re-election in the Senate, there's 34 in total. 20 of those are currently held by, by Democrats. Another, another three, sorry, are independents but Democrat-leaning. So you can imagine that if we were to have a bit of a red wave take hold on election night, that certainly we could see the House flip. Or sorry, the House stay uh, Republican, the Senate flip, and then ultimately Trump, Trump wins the White House. Okay, so let's break down what those scenarios may mean for policy. Uh, let's say we have a Harris win but a divided Congress. What impact could that have? Yeah, so I think if we take a step back and we kind of look at the key kind of campaign initiatives that, that Harris has really been, been campaigning on, it's uh, increasing taxation on corporations and, and the wealthy and basically redistributing those revenues to, to the middle class basically through increased uh, spending initiatives and, and further tax breaks. I think in a, in a world where we have a divided Congress, a lot of the tax reforms that she's been running on would be particularly hard uh, to implement. Um, but, you know, we do have the, the 2017 Trump tax cut. Some of the, the provisions, particularly on the household side of things, are set to expire in 2025. And I think both Democrats and Republicans would like to extend certainly some elements uh, of these household provisions, particularly for the income earners under that 400000 threshold. So I think that's something where we could get some agreement. Um, now, that comes with a pretty significant cost. We could see it add to the deficit by another $3 trillion over the next decade. So I think within those negotiations, Negotiations on how to potentially extend uh, those provisions of TCGA. There's going to have to be some give in terms of further cuts maybe in spending and also other sources of revenue increases through, through further increases in taxation. Um, now, most forecasters, us included, would already have built that into our baseline forecast in terms of a full extension of TCGA. So if we assume that that's kind of the, the major policy initiative under uh, this scenario, I think it's, it's kind of status quo in terms of what it would do to our forecast. It's not really going to move the, the economic needle in, in either direction. Okay, so I want to talk about another scenario. What about a Trump sweep? Yeah, so, so under this scenario, you know, Trump could really kind of implement a lot of those key campaign initi uh, uh, initiatives that he's been, that he's been running on. Uh, so that would include a full extension of TCGA, potentially lowering the corporate tax rate from 21% down to 15%. We could see uh, an elimination of taxes on Social Security and overtime pay. So, you know, when we look at all these measures, uh, they are all kind of expansionary in nature and, and could potentially grow the economy stronger than what's currently built in to our baseline forecast. Uh, but they come with a, a significant cost. So estimates suggest that, you know, the, these tax reform measures could add another $10 trillion to the deficit over the next decade. And that's significant, right? So Trump is campaigning on, you know, uh, a universal increase in tariffs of 10% across all trading partners, 60% tariff on China. This would certainly help to generate some additional revenue, probably somewhere in around two and a half, three trillion. Uh, he's also said that he would potentially cut a lot of the uh, green tax credits that were built in uh, to the Inflation Reduction Act that, of course, came into legislation a few years ago under the Biden administration. So combined, we're talking like an additional three and a half trillion of potential revenue that could be generated there. But it's only going to partially offset these, these tax reform measures that, that he's campaigning on. And I think what, what we're finding in our kind of early analysis is the, the tariffs in combination with potentially tighter border security and also uh, the potential uh, deportation of at least a million immigrants could more than offset the growth impacts from, from the tax reform. So we could live in a world where, relative to our current baseline, potentially economic growth is a bit weaker. We're seeing much higher deficits and ultimately structurally higher interest rates as well. Well, certainly this presidential election has put the spotlight on the federal deficit. Now, you point out that with both candidates, we shouldn't expect America's growing fiscal burden to go away anytime soon. Why is that? 
Yeah, I mean, if we look at uh, the deficit as a share of GDP today, it's currently sitting at six and a half percent, which is you know quite large by historical standards. If just to give you some context, if we look back in that kind of fifty-year period preceding uh, uh, the global pandemic, we saw the deficit measured as a share of GDP running closer to to three and a half percent. And you know, if we look at the CBO's baseline projection over the next decade, we're going to see the deficit widen by another twenty-two trillion dollars, and about half of that is just through increased entitlement spending, mainly because because the U.S. has an aging demographic, so we're going to see increased pressures from Social Security and Medicare. Uh, now, what's interesting is the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, which is kind of a bipartisan uh, independent think tank, put out a piece the other day where they were analyzing both candidates' platforms. And, what they found, and they did so under various assumptions and scenarios. And what they found was even under the most optimistic scenario, neither candidate's platform as it stands today would improve that deficit trajectory. And in most scenarios, it would actually worsen the, the deficit trajectory even more. Okay, and of course, right after the U.S. election, we get the Federal Reserve decision. Um, after last week's jobs report, how do you see things playing out? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, we've heard from a bunch of policymakers since the last uh, Fed decision, and they're all kind of singing a very similar tune in that uh, Fed officials are in no hurry to continue to cut the policy rate. And ultimately, you know, that, that first 50 basis point move, markets shouldn't necessarily take their cues that the Fed's going to continue to cut at that pace. And we even heard from Powell last Wednesday, and he was saying his base case is for two additional 25 basis point rate cuts in November and, and December. And I think at that point, the, the, you know, the, that sounds right to us. When you look at last week's payrolls report, we saw the U.S. economy add over 250,000 jobs. Uh, revisions to months prior were very strong, adding an additional 70,000 to the July and August figures. We saw the unemployment rate tick down by another tenth of a point for the second consecutive month, and wage pressure started to accelerate a little bit. So on the whole, a very, very strong employment report, and I think if we just kind of pull the lens back and we smooth through some of the recent volatility, uh, we're seeing a labor market that continues to decelerate but not necessarily deteriorate. And I think that is kind of further echoed when we look at things like the third quarter tracking of, of GDP, which is still running somewhere in around two and a half to three percent. So that's actually a modest acceleration to what we saw through the front half of this year. So the economy is still in really, really good shape. And I think that can give Fed officials some confidence that they could probably slow the pace of rate cuts in, in November, cut by 25, similar move in December, and then ultimately remain data dependent as they continue to adjust policy, the policy rate lower next year.